Si baba oh, oh si baba, baba baba si baba oh. Welcome to Soil to Soul 360. I'm Clifton Joseph. We're coming to you from a different book list cultural center in Toronto, a project between the cultural center and the African Canadian uh, food basket. Tonight we have uh, Leticia Diawo from the Black Creek Community Farm. Yes. She's a longtime resident and activist in the Jane and Finch community. Uh, she teaches a part-time course at George Brown College in food justice and, and food security. She is a member of a ton of organizations, especially in the Jane and Finch area. The Jane Finch on the Move, Jane Finch Action Against Poverty, the Black Creek Food Justice Network, Mothers in Motion, and she's also a member of the Toronto Food Council, Food Policy Council. Thank you, Leticia. After all of that, I'm telling you, thank you for coming here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. What is your job as a director at the Black Creek Community Farm? Um, so my work is mainly um, supporting the staff team at Black Creek Community Farm to run various programs and services to address food insecurity in the Jane and Finch community. Now, this is a farm at Jane and um, 4929 Jane Street that steals the end, uh, about to the, 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 the York University, Black Creek Pioneer Village. Eight acres of far, pristine farmland, mm -hmm. uh, a barn, a heritage building, outdoor pavilion, and so on. What, what, um, what, does, what, what, do you, what do you do at the place? So we run, uh, so we are an urban agriculture center, uh, first and foremost. Um, we run various programs and activities, so one of them being really looking at addressing food insecurity in the Jane and French community. So like I mentioned, uh, we have a market garden program um, that provides low uh, cost accessible um, fresh produce for community members. So for people who live and work in the area, we also have a seniors program, which really looks at reducing senior isolation and building connections. So really using gardening as a tool um, for, for seniors to come together, share a meal, garden together, do preservation workshops, and even do yoga at times. We also have a youth internship program so the program is sort of in two cohorts. One is looking at uh, youth who are out of school, out of work, and providing them with work experience, and also partnering with um, partner organizations like Chocolate Soul Chocolate Traders, where they get to learn how to make chocolate using some of the um, uh, produce that they grew at the farm, like mint or cacao pumpkin, like last year, what we did with them. We also have a field, uh, a field school program which is really uh, focused on uh, the schools, uh, not only in our community, but also across the city um, in doing environmental education um, um, activities with, with children as well. And also we are a farm park, and you're probably wondering what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Tree canopy um, in the Jane and Finch community is not that much. So we have this beautiful eight acre land why not open it up for families to come and, and enjoy and hang, and hang out, have a picnic, use our brick oven, make pizza, uh, bake some bread, and just hang out at the farm um, and, 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 and enjoy the, the activities there. Because I, uh, the full disclosure too, I've done some work with the African Food Basket. Had a little plot there myself and grew something last season, looking forward to the next season. Mm -hmm. um, how has it been attracting people from the community, the, the or surrounding community, to come on and, and become urban farmers, uh, as it were? Yeah, so um, through various ways. So we also have small allotment gardens 
that community members can actually uh, get a plot of land and also grow their own vegetables. And you don't need to be a highly skilled gardener or grower to do that. Um, all experiences are welcome. And we also recognize that for some families, this is another way for them to get their hands in the soil um, and to grow some vegetables to add to um, um, their, their vegetable or their produce uh, for, the, for the week. Um, one other program that um, I forgot to mention, um, sorry, I'm blanking out, but one other, there are many different programs that we run mm. at the farm. Um, of getting on a people regular, involved in the Yeah, and also we do a lot of workshops and a lot of events and a lot of activities that community members can engage in. Mm -hmm. as well. I was up at, I must confess, I was up at your uh, fundraiser uh, dinner. dinner at the farm, which was a magnificent event, a whole day and evening of performances and different vendors, music, food, um, drinks, uh, local artisans and so on. It was, it was damn successful. W what, what part does that play in terms of your whole fundraising efforts for the year? So um, it's actually played a really key part. So the dinner is not only to raise money, but it's also to build friendship and to uh, provide a bit of support for the work that we're doing at the Black Creek Community Farm. So every year, um, actually we started in 2017, and honestly in 2017 when we started, we didn't really have a goal in mind. It was just, you know, let's just do this event, invite people to come enjoy the space, and make some friends. Um, and that was sort of the main aim uh, for that year. And then we did it again um, last year, where we actually doubled our numbers in terms of people. So we went from 200 people to 400 people um, uh, the following year, and we really wanted it to have a real community feel. A lot of dinner events, it's like downtown focus, but we wanted to do something in Finch that also community members can come, participate in, and enjoy, uh, but also raise a little bit of money to support the work that we're doing at the farm. Mm -hmm. How did a sister like you get into, born in Ghana, here in Toronto, how did you get into farming and this whole situation with the Black Creek Community Farm? Um, so so I, I joined um, the Black Creek Community Farm actually from the beginning um, back in 2013. I was a community engagement coordinator. And to be honest, when I got into the project, I didn't have much of a strong background in agriculture. But as a community organizer, I knew very well what the plight and what the issues are within my community as it relates to food. So a lot of, um, so I'm one of the uh, founding members of uh, Jane Finch Action Against Poverty. And a lot of the work that we've been doing was around the special diet cuts, ODSP rate, OW rate, um, and also looking at the 2009 report that came out and found that the Jane and Finch community was actually paying about 7% more for fresh produce in comparison to other neighborhoods across the city. So as part of uh, Jane Finch Action Against Poverty's work was really looking at, we started a campaign called Food Right Right Food Campaign, was really looking at what are some of the issues specifically around that um, that is really affecting the community? Yeah, like, like what, yeah, that's, that's uh, the biggest question somebody has in their mind. Why would you be spending more in a community like that where it's not even organic produce, I don't imagine? Exactly, and, and I don't think any of the, the, the corporations that have uh, um, um, the grocery stores in our community can actually give an honest answer to the reason why. And the like prices, we don't the prices know why. are higher. Yeah, why is it that the prices are higher, um, including milk, right? Why is the prices higher? And also, one other interesting piece is, imagine they had done the study with also cultural foods. Because mm -hmm. if cultural foods was also added to the study, they'll find that actually people are paying more, right? Because as we know, buying plantain or callaloo or other um, sort of cultural world food items that is flown in is probably going to cost mm -hmm. a lot more as well. So it gives you an idea of how much people in our community are actually spending on, on fresh produce overall. So when I became involved in this project, yes, I'm not a farmer. I don't come from a farming background, but I understood 
um, from um, my organizing work and, and community mobilizing work that food security, food justice is a, is a huge issue within a community. And of course, a small farm like Black Creek Community Farm isn't going to solve it all, but I think it could be that demonstration farm that looks at agroecology, that looks at food justice, and, and can look at how we can bring different stakeholders together and, and different community members together to really um, um, address um, that very systemic issue, because it is systemic, right? Mm -hmm. You've been around the scene in, in the local food security movement in, in Toronto and across the province, Sam. Um, what do you think of black participation? Do you, are you seeing enough black participation? Are, are blacks given a, 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 a seat at the table? Are we so still only no, represented? I don't think so. If you look at um, the Agriculture Foreign Worker Program, right, it's dominantly black and brown bodies that are growing the food for us in Ontario, mm -hmm. whether we like to accept it or not. Um, and we are also the s people that are dealing with the inequities within this food system also uh, um, uh, very harshly. But when it comes to having, being at the table or even that leadership that isn't there, that isn't provided, because we still can agree that migrant workers uh, or the agriculture foreign worker program, that they also have a right um, to access health benefits um, in this country, even though they pay into it. Mm -hmm. So I think for as long as some of those systemic issues that is facing our community um, is not being addressed, is not being heard, and there isn't platform given to that, um, we're still going to continue to see some of these issues. Mm -hmm. One of the key things you helped uh, implement at uh, the Black Creek Community Farm is th it's this residence council. Um, where you residents are actually represented in the, uh, getting into the fold of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, how has that gone and, and why was that so important to you in terms of getting people in, in the community inside of the organization itself? Um, for me, um, when I came involved, you know, you have an organization that is a white rural organization that has never done work with racialized or black or brown people um, has uh, in our community, now in our community trying to address food security issues in our community. When I came in, the reason why I felt having a resident council is important is because that accountability and, and, and when we talk about food sovereignty and having a community be able to determine for them what this project needs to look like and, and, and how to address um, the issues was very important. So from the get-go, I knew that if we don't have um, a strong community group that can really hold the organizations at the table accountable to really make sure that the farm is addressing uh, some of the challenges and issues in the community, then it will be lost, right? So we will have a farm in Jane and Finch that people can't even access, that people can't even uh, get food from. So um, it was very, very important to me that we have that strong uh, uh, support um, and that strong backing from community members. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, farming ain't easy, and sometimes you might romanticize the farmer <laughs> and romanticize the urban farming and so on. Yeah. Um, what are some of the what are some of the difficulties, or what are some of the things that people know that when you commit to farming, even if you get a little plot of land that you 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 could for yourself to do um, in the season, what what do you need to know? Oh, like from how serious a, from, do you got so to So from a non-farmer who mm -hmm. have uh, worked <laughs> alongside a lot of farmers, um, farming takes a great deal of skill. Mm -hmm, no doubt. Um, a great deal of hard work, a great deal of patience mm -hmm. um, to be able to really uh, uh, do it. And I think having the patience um, um, to learn um, but also knowing very well how um, enriching it is when you're growing um, sustainably and organically um, and learning about the ecosystem. So, you know, you go into it, or at least for me at the beginning, it was like, oh, you know, you just plant something and then it becomes mm -hmm. food and then you just harvest it dig, and then we're dig. good. But actually thinking about the science that's involved and the importance of biodiversity, the importance of uh, having a rich ecosystem that could support, like understanding the benefits of pollinators to your garden um, 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 is, 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 I think is very enriching and it's something that um, I have learned a great deal um, from a lot of uh, the, the farmers. 
What about, uh, I know for me, myself, uh, being up there sometimes at, at the farm, it's so peaceful until you say the plane, the planes come by, and even that to <laughs> me is a bit of a, a romance in itself. Uh, I love that kind of interruption. But um, <clears throat> you feel so at home, and when you see your, 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 your crop, growing as you as you tend them what are some of the experience you've seen from people in terms of just the wondrousness of of being in the farm and, and how it, it gives the people something more yeah you know um when you um when you just first walk into the farm you're just amazed that this really um pristine farmland exists in the jane and finch in the heart of the jane and finch community um and there is something very common and and just um, 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 just being in that space, there's something just very common being in that space um, um, at the farm, um, and something that just reminisces back home for me. Anyway, I grew up in a small village, and um, um, it was a farming village. So just being at the farm just reminds me of home. And I think for a lot of people that have come at the farm that have shared their experiences, that's what it brings for them, that feeling of home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, it ain't easy to, like you said, farming ain't easy, but it's not easy either to uh, attract people to an uh, organic lifestyle, to a fresh produce lifestyle. When uh, there are cheaper stores around, in some cases, maybe not in the Jenny Finch area, as you say, it's more expensive, but, but the, the law of uh, no-name stores and cheap grocery stores where somebody might say, it's, uh, I'd like to eat organic, but it's, it's too... Expensive. It's too expensive, or I'd like to be at the farm, but it takes too much time. What, what kind of strategies have you been racking your head with of trying to just get people away from that negative headspace? Yeah, space? And, 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 and to speak on that uh, negative, that's because if you look at the local organic food scene, right, there is like an image that most people have, white, young, mm -hmm. middle class uh, folks. Um, Bland um, tasting food. Yeah, and, and, and so... For a lot of people, when they hear organic, it's like, okay, I'm just going to walk that way because it's something that I can't access, right? That's usually what, and it's true. Organic farming does cost a bit more because it's much more intensive. But what we, the, the, the way we're looking at it is trying to tell people about the good, healthy food and why they should, uh, why they have a right as low-income people to also access good, healthy food um, within your community. So instead of using buy organic food, mm -hmm. is buy good, healthy food. And also our um, sliding scale price point for people, we don't ask for... Mm -hmm. um, if you ain't got it, you don't have to give yeah, it Yeah, you don't have to give any information to prove that you're low-income to access these vegetables, right? Um, we make sure, we try to our best to, and I'm sure it's not a perfect system, but we try to make sure that if folks want to access the low income rate, they can do that, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. yeah. So go back into some more then about how you set up that basket. Is it weekly, monthly, or so is what do you get? So, um, so you get from eight to about um, 11 items in your basket. Every week? Um, every week or you can actually do every other week as well mm -hmm. and then starting in July we will have an on-site market where our prices are also marked down as well so from July to October you can drop in Monday to um, Saturday mm -hmm. and purchase our surplus uh, stuff vegetables. that was just grown and just picked and yeah just farmed. yeah and I think that's one of the beautiful things the fact that it was harvested just 24 hours mm -hmm. and is on your plate um, and you taste the huge difference between a carrot that is grown locally from a farmer and a carrot that is grown um, in California. Um, uh, bought here through some trucks and uh, yeah. frozen and freezing <laughs> yeah. and frozen and freezing and <laughs> yeah. you know, at the store, yeah, uh, definitely warehouse for a while before before it gets there. Yeah. W what has been your own personal experience with um, your plot, little plots of land, or how do you how do you, how have your experiences been uh, um, uh, with my own plot of land? So I did grow zucchini. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I must say, I think nature did most of that work for me. And I remember the first time I saw the zucchini, I was just so happy. I was like, I can't believe I planted something and, and, and I got this beautiful fruit out of it. Mm -hmm. And I remember just going around telling people, like, I grew that this zucchini. Is mine. This it's is me, mine. I'm me, like, can me. I get a certification that I'm a farmer <laughs> now? You know, <laughs> it's like, I did it. Um, 
there's a huge pride and there's a huge self uh, huge uh, self esteem that it builds, especially for kids who come through our program. You see for some of the kids who have been in our program from like three years ago till now, them being involved in the soil, them growing their own food. You see how um, the parents report how much it actually builds their self-esteem. So look at me as an adult, just being ecstatic at the, the thought that I grew this zucchini, even though you know nature did most of that work. Mm -hmm. I don't even think I weeded as much as I should, but think about what that does for a young child um, and, and the self-esteem that it boosts and also even how it helps and it promotes them to eat healthier as well mm -hmm. um, by being involved. Like you could sit down uh, with a group of youth and say, don't eat McDonald's, don't eat this, don't eat that. After the meeting, they'll just go right back to McDonald's and eat the same thing mm -hmm. that you said not mm -hmm. to. But when you are working with youth and engaging youth in the actual growing of food, they start to ask questions and they start to make that decision on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, the beautiful things uh, about, about local uh, farming and the importance of engaging um, youth and children. Um, and, 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 and for our community too, I mean, it, uh, the black community is susceptible to um, high rates in certain diseases, cancer, uh, breast cancer, fibroids, um, diabetes. stroke, diabetes, and so on. So tell me then about the, the relationship between that kind of, uh, uh, those diseases and the, the food lifestyle we have. Well, you know, and I can speak only from my community. So the Jane and Finch community, um, is, is, has, deals with so many systemic issues, housing, employment, education, food security. It's also the same community that have high rates of diabetes, high rates of high cholesterol, um, um, and, and all these things are very much related to mm. each other. So in our community, um, of course, if you have a low-income community that are facing so many of these systemic issues, you're also going to see the same health outcomes, right? The, the mm -hmm. ill health outcomes. And, and the problems are very systemic. So to believe that a small farm like Black Creek Community Farm alone is going to deal with some of those issues, we know that that's not true. But I think if we can challenge those systems at the top, um, and in the middle and at the bottom, yeah. all of them, <laughs> all of all them, them systems. Um, then that's how we're going to make uh, systemic changes. Um, um, and that's how, and we have to keep fighting back, right? We cannot accept the status quo because people in our community are dying. Um, and, 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 and mental health also plays a key role in that as well. Mm -hmm. So, but food is basic, right? So, um, it's I, a human I, right. I still eat my meat, you yeah. know what I mean? Don't, don't eat the pork, y'all. Stay away from the pork <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> but um, we like our oxtail, our curry goat, our fried chicken, deep fried chicken, our fries. I mean, not to be too stereotypical, sis, but we like our fried foods. But those are all colonial foods mm -hmm. that were survival foods. Those were not our foods. I always use this analogy of, you know, in Ghana, we have the ayua, which is a clay, um, like a clay thing that you use uh, to grind up your food. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then we were introduced to the frying pan. When you take the ayua away, Ghanaian cuisine changes drastically. And the frying pan, even to make a spinach stew, back in the days, you just, you steam it, you grind it with your, a little bit of pepper, a little bit of tomatoes, and a little bit of onion. You boil your yam or your plantain, and you eat it with it. And that's super healthy. Now, when you remove that ayua, because mm -hmm. now we are more modernized or we want to be more Eurocentric, Eurocentric, and you replace that with the frying pan. So now guess what we're doing? We pour oil, we put a little bit of um, onion, and then we fry the, the spinach and we boil our yam and we eat it with it. You've changed the health quality of that food mm -hmm. dra drastically. So I think it's recognizing that there are survival foods that we had to learn that were given to us, um, um, that we eat now, that has a huge impact on our health. 
but that if we were to really look at how we decolonize our food and go back to the old ways, we will find that a lot of our food was actually super healthy mm -hmm. and, and super rich for our health. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how does then that relate to the programs you run in terms of... Sorry? How, uh, how does that relate to some of the programs you run about pre preparation of food and bringing people onto the farm to show To be honest, I don't believe um, that our community needs food um, training or, you know, because a lot of times, you know, public health, nurses, different institutions come into the community and they believe one way that they can change things is by food literacy programs, by literally just teaching people how to cook food. Mm -hmm. I believe our aunties in our community know how to prepare healthy meals and know how to cook really well. I think the health issues that our community is facing, again, is very systematic. It goes back again to the work that they are, um, 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 they are getting, to the uh, minimum wage, the fact that a lot of uh, seniors are retiring with nothing and they work for some companies for many, many years. So there are many multiple um, issues that the community members are facing, which it is then um, um, having a challenge on their health. Um, when I think about cooking programs, I think it's a way to bring people together, to share, and to talk. Um, but I don't think it should be a focus as in, um, you know, I'm here to now teach you mm -hmm. how to eat better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I, I, I saw that I was out of town when it happened, but I saw the, the Black Vegans of Toronto had a, a big food fair and exposition the other day. And a couple of thousand people were there, the Oakwood Village Barns. I, mm -hmm. I was really, really, really impressed. So uh, it does seem as if the numbers of people, black folks here in Toronto especially, and I guess across the province and, and, and around the world probably, mm -hmm. are visibly more interested and among many of them are vegetarians and vegans. How do you assess the rise of the popularity of veganism and vegetarianism in, in the black community? Um, I think um, we know that in the black community, veganism, vegetarianism have existed for a very long time. I think it's, um, we're being told <laughs> that it's like, yeah, and, 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 and especially in the Rastafarian community, but, um, and, and that's not recognized, right, as like, um, as, as something that existed that black people were, were, were practicing for a very long time. So now it feels like, and, and, and I, I think it's true, there are a lot more people that are joining, but I think they need to understand um, 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 and pay homage um, <laughs> to the people before them and to understand for what it is and to also make sure that they're not antagonizing um, um, other people who, um, because of just the way in terms of the whiteness of veganism in mm. Toronto, is turning people off, to be honest. So I think we just need to find a balance um, between the two. But you do find that there are more black folks in, into it these days. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. A, a and spike. I think, and I would say there are more black people that are interested in their health. And I think health is a huge driver for people getting into veganism. That I think there are more and more people becoming very conscious of what they're putting into their body and want to make sure that what they're putting into their body is something that's going to heal them and it's something that can be a medicine as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the food security movement, the activist work you've been doing around the city and so on for years, um, uh, and shows that food is, is very political. Food policy yeah. is, is very political. <laughs> and, and that gets even closer into view when you project internationally. The country you were born in, Ghana, is one of the key fighters against GMO foods, GMO seeds, and the international uh, capitalist system of food distribution and so on, and, and uh, has a pretty good uh, record on food security. Uh, what do you make of that? And what do you ma what what are your connections to the food security movement in Ghana? Um, I don't um, I don't have a strong connection with the food uh, movement in Ghana. I am part of a, a WhatsApp group of um, academics, farmers in, in on the continent that are trying to make changes. Um, it's very difficult, um, from my understanding, in terms of what you're describing. Um, 
a lot of chemical companies are turning to 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 the, those parts of world to sell their chemicals, right? And and you're using government to to get that there. So now, if a farmer wants to get subsidies, and the farmer is being told, you know, you got to use, you got to mm -hmm. buy this chemical, yeah. and you got to use it on your farm to be able to get uh, money. But then those same chemicals are running into the stream and the river where they fetch water for food, where the kids are bathing in, and, and, and it is causing so many health effects. And a lot of those corporations are from this part of the world, and there is no responsibility or accountability. So I think the fight on the continent is huge, and there are many... Um, organizers, academics, farmers there who are fighting every day um, to really make sure that, you know, Ghanaian agriculture um, um, or Ghanaian indigenous food systems is, is protected and preserved. But they have a long battle ahead of them. In terms of GMO foods, from my understanding, um, um, it, 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 the farmers lost. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, but it's, 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 you know, to fight another day. Mm -hmm. Speaking of fighting, you've been fighting for so long yourself. You're a member of so many organizations and a number of boards. You've uh, volunteered and been a part of a number of agencies doing things. And with this director at uh, the Black Creek Community Farm, that takes a lot of time, too. You also have two children yourself, too, yeah. and has a school load and you're teaching. What's been the balance, or how do you maintain that kind of balance for your own self in terms of all of the whirlwind of all the things that you've been doing? Um, to be honest, it's been uh, pretty difficult. Um, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something like um, a lot of the things that I'm involved in, I've sort of taken a step back on um, because there's a lot to. It's a lot of time. It's, it's, a, it's a, a lot of time, too. A lot of time, a lot of meetings. And, lot and, of and having two children uh, makes it uh, much more difficult. So I am very much aware of the mental toll mm -hmm. that it can have. Um, well, what keeps you going now, though? I mean, before you decide, you know what, I'm going to slow down or hang up the chips or something. Right now, you're still going, you're still it's, pumping. It's, what it's is my, it? It's my passion for my community. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that really keeps me going is my passion for my community and really um, looking at how uh, we can continue to build a strong, resilient, resistant community that will fight every day against the status quo. Um, um, I think it's what drives me and also my children, um, really trying to see how um, I can create a better world um, or I can support the creation of a better world for them. Mm -hmm. I can't lose hope, right? Because yeah. of them, nope. I have to keep going. Keep Bob Hope alive. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, thank you so much, uh, Letitia Diao, the uh, director of the Black Creek Community um, farm here in Toronto at 4929 Jane Street. How can I get to, to you and to become part of this enterprise? Um, um, where our gates are open Monday to Friday in the winter. Um, folks, um, nine to five uh, folks are welcome to stop by and see what we have um, going um, this season. We have a few volunteer opportunities as well at the farm and a few events. They can check our uh, Facebook page or um, website, uh, blackcreekfarm.ca, um, to get more information about and also more support. I think the more support we, uh, we can pull together as a community um, to support the small local farm, the better. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you for watching another edition of Soil to Soul 360 with your host Clifton Joseph, a, a project between the uh, African Food Basket and the uh, a different book list cultural center here in Toronto. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.